Okay, the colleagues, I'm very glad to be here and uh, to make this presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking about a uh, joint project between, between uh, Austrian and Russian Academies of Sciences. Um, and uh, yes, this is a project which is only going to be started, so all these schemes I will have, uh, are, they are about mostly cooperation and uh, this will be the first part of my presentation, very short, and then I will so more precisely on the data which we are going to uh, use. So uh, at first, uh, overall vision of the in our cooperation process, it must lead to uh, more productivity, better quality and increasing visibility. And uh, which implies innovation and competitiveness. Uh, here you have some uh, methods which we use, uh, open innovation process, networking, collaboration, open science and so on and uh, technical infrastructures, uh, which will be important for us. Uh, DAVIA, um, project of biodiversity and linguistic diversity, which is held now in the Academy of Sciences of Austria, and uh, some social infrastructures as well. So this is short information about uh, our institutions. Uh, so my um, co-author is a representative of Austrian Center for Digital Humanities. Uh, which is a part of Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna, and uh, our work uh, for the Institute for Linguistic Studies, which is situated in St. Petersburg. So uh, here are some words about collaboration design. So maybe I'm not a specialist in this uh, topic, and um, so you can uh, have this uh, material on slides, and so uh, maybe uh, I will skip it. So there are some schemes about uh, how the cooperation will be implemented. So, and I suppose it's uh, uh, not, uh, it's of course important, but uh, I uh, like to stop uh, on the social infrastructures. Uh, so we are going to use Wikidata and um, use it maybe for Ontolex. Uh, as an Ontolex model and uh, use some materials of it, and uh, then uh, materials of Russian lexicons uh, can be contributed to uh, Wikidata as well. So, uh, and there are some steps which are going to uh, have uh, at first a group experiments, prototyping, the second one, organizational upscaling and institutionalization, and the third one, uh, joint. Uh, in process, um, and uh, you can read uh, more precisely on the slide. And now, uh, what is more interesting for me is a description of material which we are going to use. Uh, these are uh, Russian manuscript lexicons, and here are general information about them. So they were created in the middle of the 16th century, and now we have about 150 lexicons uh, which are um, which can be found in different places, different repositories from Moscow, St. Petersburg, uh, Novosibirsk, uh, Odessa, and other cities. And uh, as there are a lot of them, we have more than nine types of them, and not all of them are studied. Um, and still, there every type is very important. And uh, depending on the type, they have from uh, 700 up to 16,000 root entries. The manuscript and some of the manuscript are just awful, um, enormous volumes, um, enormous um, uh, books, and of course it's very difficult to study them uh, without uh, computational methods. Uh, what is the difference? Um, uh, what is the peculiarity of the of the uh, lexicons? Uh, unlike um, glossaries, which were before them. Uh, they had alphabet uh, arrangement of text, of uh, network entries. And uh, that was the big step uh, forward in uh, the lexicography of Russia. Uh, then uh, the, another peculiarity is that they have close connection to the text, and if uh, a word in the text was in a, in a case, um, executive case or prepositional case, or maybe a word was, a word was in a... a present tense uh, or past tense. So in, the, in these forms, they came to the lexicons and uh, they preserved uh, these uh, forms. That means that there were no uh, normalization of uh, headwords. And uh, 
what words we can find there. Uh, the aim of uh, lexicons were to explain uh, words which were uh, difficult for understanding, and uh, most of them are of foreign origin. Uh, for example, we can find the Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Church, Slavonic, Ruthenian, Tata, Arab, Persian, and German words. And this is, of course, very interesting to study them and to understand what language they came from and how they changed their meaning and so on. Uh, that's why uh, these lexicons are an important source uh, for historical lexicography, and uh, some of them uh, were used, but of course, uh, there are several of them not all. Uh, so, here uh, I uh, tried to show the typical structure of word entry. Uh, so, uh, head word we have, as a head word, we have a, usually a foreign word. Here, for example, we have a Greek word, nomos. Uh, they are written in uh, Cyrillic letters. Mm, and uh, over them, we usually have a language mark. Uh, not always, but uh, uh, still, compilers wanted to understand what language the word came from, and uh, they uh, marked uh, this language by initial letters uh, over the head word. Here we have letter uh, G, that means that this is uh, Greek language. Then uh, we have explanatory part, uh, usually this is a translation of the Greek word or other words, or maybe a more uh, bigger, in, bigger explanation. And also, uh, sometimes we have a source, literary source from which this word with the explanation was taken. Here we have uh, uh, teaching him by uh, Ukraine Syrian, uh, teaching him number 40. Uh, not always, but sometimes we have such precise uh, um, marks of uh, the source, and uh, not of them are correct because uh, during the um, multiple written process, uh, some of them were uh, not exact, not no, not correct. But uh, sometimes this is the exact place where we can find this word. Sometimes with uh, explanation, maybe in the margins or somewhere else, maybe some somewhere in the text. Uh, so, uh, sometimes uh, this designation of language was put over the uh, headword, uh, but what, it wasn't the, um, this, the only way to, uh, uh, to show what uh, language, uh, from what language this word came from. So, another way is uh, just to uh, tell this in the explanatory part of word entries. And here, for example, I took um, and gave an entry. Uh, word entry uh, where a German word uh, is explained, Mangul group. Uh, then we see that uh, there are some equivalents. Uh, so, in this way, um, the compiler wanted to give some equivalents in order to understand and to show the meaning. Uh, in Russian, Svetla, in Greek, Salon, in Latin, Blatra Oblita, in German, Romanistic, uh, Polis, so one more equivalent in uh, German. Uh, so here we can see that uh, the root origin is shown just in the explanation part. Uh, then it can be by special sites in the margins uh, for Greek or Ruthenian words, or maybe in, in, as a subtitle before groups of words of uh, the same origin uh, in the margins or just in the text itself. Uh, so, what languages we can find uh, there, or languages and words of what languages? Of course, the most part of uh, words for words are Greek because uh, most part of translated uh, literature uh, was uh, from Greek, and that's why there were a lot of Greek words which were not uh, uh, translated properly, is it possible to say so, but are just transliterated, and that's why they were unclear for, um, uh, for readers. And uh, as the aim of this uh, lesson was where to explain this word, so uh, they had. They have a lot of uh, Greek words uh, written in Cyrillic letters uh, with translation or maybe with uh, explanation. So here we have example Igemon, uh, commander of an army. Uh, in Russian we have just equivalent, one equivalent, uh, and of course this is Greek uh, word Igemon. Then uh, some words came from Latin. Here we have Consolatra from Forja from Latin. Uh, then Hebrew, uh, some Hebrew words came uh, via um, translation of uh, Bible uh, and some names, uh, for example, uh, Armageddon, uh, place of battle from Hebrew, 
um, then Aramaic, uh, you know, some uh, Aramaic phrases of uh, Christ in uh, both posts, and uh, this is one of them, for example, a fafa in the open for Aramaic. Church uh, Slavonic, we know that Church um, Slavonic, uh, some of words uh, of Church Slavonic were obsolete. Uh, we know that's new, new words in them. And uh, for example, Malgena wasn't uh, in use uh, at the period of uh, lexicon creation, and we have explanation here Malgena, Hazard, and White from Church Slavonic Malgena. And uh, some words, uh, old Russian words, which were obsolete also for readers, uh, can be explained there. For example, vir, omut. So we have old words here and newer one, omut, uh, whirlpool. Uh, so that uh, people who, readers who uh, used to uh, read this literature understood what, was, uh, what this word meant. And uh, also there can be some uh, sort of modern languages, but modern I uh, supposed um, to the compiler of the lexicon, because of course a Ruthenian uh, language at the time was in use, it was the uh, language of um, Grand uh, Dutch of Lithuania, and uh, in some lexicons we have uh, very, a lot of such words, uh, and here for example Lichet, uh, he pounds from Ruthenian language uh, and, and that type it was very important to understand uh, the, such words because some of them came into the uh, Russian language and they were new for them. Uh, then Serbian words as, as we know that some of the uh, translations from Greek were uh, made in Serbia and they, uh, they had some Serbian words uh, which were not clear. Then Turkish uh, for example, bichak, knife, uh, taja, aksak, lame man, Persian, abashak. Yes, we have an example, abashak, Persian, which was called so from Persian. And uh, in uh, the lexicons of the second part of the 17th century, we can find even quite a lot of German words. Uh, and uh, even we know some uh, texts from which they came. Uh, and here one example, water, uh, water from German Wasser, of course. Uh, so uh, that's why it's uh, interesting for people who study not only ancient languages, but modern as well, or maybe languages of 16th and 17th uh, centuries. Uh, so, to, so what research perspective we can have if we will have a, a database or bigger infrastructure uh, in which we can uh, search uh, words according to some uh, positions, some of the peculiarities. Uh, for example, we can obtain statistical data because now, uh, of course, it's very difficult to understand what the amount of words from a certain language, and here we will be able to uh, understand the number of words from a particular foreign language, or what was uh, what language maybe gave us uh, the more influence mostly um, onto the Russian language and uh, what words we will have now in uh, later periods. Uh, then we can understand basic lexical semantic groups, so what uh, uh, words uh, were taken from other languages, uh, what they uh, meant and what groups were of most importance. Uh, then uh, we can uh, understand what was the most important source, from which source uh, came the, the most uh, foreign words came into Russian language and uh, into this lexicon. And of course, uh, as in any process of uh, foreign words adaptation, there are a lot of variations. Uh, in spelling, for example, we can uh, see different ways of spelling the word Bokma. Uh, then in phonetics, uh, of course, uh, Greek words has uh, have different um, pronunciation. Uh, sometimes uh, biblioteca, sometimes biblioteca, biblioteca, and uh, all the, uh, such variants we can find in lexicons. In grammar categories as well, uh, not often, but sometimes we can understand that uh, that or this or that word uh, is masculine or feminine and. But here, for example, sometimes we can understand according to the context of the explanation that it is masculine and sometimes that it is feminine. Uh, then word formation, 
uh, or Kinsinari for the uh, the work of the same Greek root, but with uh, different uh, suffixes. And uh, sometimes we can understand differences in meaning, uh, because uh, in one uh, lexicon we can find only one meaning, and another two, three, or more meaning for the same root. And here we have an example, Laura is a monastery of St. John, and uh, this is only one meaning, and another lexicon, Laura is a separate monastery, so the same, and also for in Greek, so it's the, another meaning, or I don't remember it was another, no, the same word, yes, in Greek, but it has just made a homonym, um, and it denoted fire, and here we have uh, both, uh, uh, both meanings. And how can we how can we use uh, this uh, data? Um, one of the projects how to use them is to uh, um, use them in the project of for biodiversity and linguistic diversity, which is now in the uh, which uh, is now being implemented in the Australian Academy of Sciences. Uh, the aim of this project is to collect all the plant names. Uh, which can be collected in general, and of course, uh, this data, data from uh, old Russian manuscripts and lexicons, uh, will be of more importance, I suppose, because we can sometimes we cannot find such data in any other materials. And uh, then we can, of course, uh, use this data for Wikidata, for Europeana, and uh, for other. Um, uh, Structures for diacos uh, and for new uh, structures such as Yevodat E E G I. So, thank you for your attention. That's all that I wanted to say. So, I would make one, obviously, I hardly ever do, Kira, which is a suggestion on the English, but I would switch that from language lexicons to, uh, le to lexicon man or to manuscript lexicons to lexicon manuscripts. Because mm -hmm. I understood this, the title, differently. Uh -huh. uh, and <laughs> it's just, that's a case of word order. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and everything is fine. So the only, but it was a really interesting shift. I think this is a fascinating project. I think that the I, one of my ambitions is that focusing on Greek will focus upon a shared area of cultural heritage between the Orthodox universe uh, and the rest of Europe. Because a lot of what I want, I want to do is, is to use scholarly inquiry to, to, uh, to highlight shared ideas and shared background at a period of time when I think it would be a good thing to have more in common between Russia, Europe, and other places, to be honest. Uh, so I think we have, it's a service. I think the intellectual challenges of all those languages is, is fascinating. Uh, I see this world as similar and really different. Uh, and I, I'll just point out already today, I have now on my, up in front of me, Russian with some English in it. I was looking at, uh, at, your, at the Georgian site, uh, with, with my link to a bilingual corporate already this morning. Uh, I was looking at Armenian, uh, and of course I was looking at Arabic. Uh, I have to be able to understand the Arabic in the past. Uh, the other languages, not so much. So I think we're already in the space of seeing the challenge of and the need for global philology going, you know, we, can't, we can't all just use English all the time. And so, uh, any more, some more, any questions for Kira? Yeah. 